Good evening and welcome to our last session of Walking with God. I hope that you've enjoyed our session so far. I know that I have as well. Um, our last one is called The Field Guide to Walking. And certainly, I think we all walk. We've established that at this point. And that there are no experts in walking unless, as you would have seen um, with the Olympic race walkers, unless you're an Olympian. And this sense of um, accomplishment or this, this idea that we think of mastering, um, Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. But normally, walking and certainly discipleship isn't something that we think of as mastering. And, it's in this, and we think of this in the same way that we might think about a sport or an instrument. And certainly, we don't think about walk, mastering walking even after our first birthday, especially since walking isn't really even a school sport that you can sign up for. Walking, it reminds us that we're weak. When we walk, we learn that we can easily twist our ankle, that toddlers fall on average of 17 times an hour, and even new baby walkers fall an average of 69 times an hour. We learn that humans, compared to other mammals, aren't actually very good walkers. Like certainly horses and cattle and giraffes all learn to walk within the first hour that they're born. Whereas for humans, up it takes us you know, a year or over a year to learn how to walk. And everyone who can walk, certainly will walk, and even the most sedentary, even if they only get up from the bed to the couch, or the table to the fridge, or from their desk to the copier. We walk, for the most part, because we can't help it, because even an escalator, or an elevator, or a car, or a golf cart is unavailable to us. And we walk up and down stairs, and we walk the length of hallways, and through malls, and through restaurants. And most of us walk without thinking, or walk without being grateful for being able to walk, or even maybe walk resentfully to our, towards our car. Our walking most often is accidental, incidental, inevitable, and sometimes grudgingly. But not all of us. Some of us think that walking is beautiful and mysterious and sometimes maybe even a little bit dangerous. We walk because we see things differently. We feel more differently and think more clearly. We walk to figure things out. We walk to sort ourselves out. We walk to get in shape, to make sense of the scale of things, the smallness of beetles, and the real distance between places. We walk because we experience the world in, in fresh ways, and I think in ways perhaps closer to reality. We walk because about three miles an hour, as the writer Rebecca Solznit says, is about the same speed of thought, and perhaps even the same speed as our souls. We walk because if we got much faster and for much longer, we might start to lose ourselves. Our bodies might atrophy, our thinking might jumble, and our very souls will wither. We walk because three miles an hour seems to be the pace that God keeps. It's God's speed. Walking is spiritual formation, it's healing, it's exercise, it's prayer, it's pilgrimages, suffering, friendship, and attentiveness. Walking is about taking our first steps. It's about setting out. It's about winding our way. Walking is about being alongside the God who, incarnate in Jesus, turns to us and says, always on foot, come, follow me. When we walk, we encounter invitations to get off the path, detours, shelters, changes in scenery and companions, God with us on the road. And whether we walk around the neighborhood or we hike a trail, it offers us the potential to awaken our life with Christ in, in a way that's reviving and it embodies both body and soul. Certainly these sort of detour, detours I found funny along the side of roads that say things like penguins, which you might see if you were in Cape Town, or potholes. Or even when I was in Prince Edward Island, there was a sign that said, watch out for church traffic, which I didn't know that church would have so much traffic that you would have to watch out for. And certainly, uh, we all have practices to get us started when we walk. 
Uh, we have we were able to um, do various practices in the Christian tradition like pilgrimage and labyrinth, and we'll actually end with a final walking practice called Stations of the Cross. Now, Stations of the Cross is a journey that we walk with Jesus, and it's typically about 14 or 15 stations, and they're placed along around the sanctuary as a way to reflect on his journey to the cross and something that we particularly use during Holy Week. This particular walk, which has also been called the Way of the Cross, was a custom for pilgrims who visited Jerusalem on Holy Thursday to retrace the footsteps of Jesus during his last hour. And they've done this since the fourth century. And certainly the tradition of having 14 stations was first seen in Spain in the 17th century, and they used sculptings and paintings to represent certain moments of Jesus's journey to the cross. And they're often placed along the edges of the church building, similar to about where stained glass windows would be placed. And they're they're very common, especially in Catholic and Anglican and Lutheran churches. And certainly, once it was actually safe to journey to Jerusalem after the Crusades, these same moments that had been placed around a a sanctuary or a church or even a garden, um, they also placed these and recorded this around the city of Jerusalem in a journey called the Via Dolorosa, which is the Way of Sorrows. The Stations of the Cross, they're a meditative journey, and it involves walking from one station slowly to the next station. And we often stop at each station and reflect on an image in in particularly, and remember that moment in Jesus' journey as a way to walk with him in the solidarity of his suffering. More modern versions of the stations include a 15th station to recall the resurrection as an integral part of the Paschal ministry. The stations involve the whole person in prayer. They're in, we're invited on this visual journey as well as this physical and spiritual one. And typically churches will actually have like booklets or reflections to accompany you on this reflective journey. And there's se- several different types of stations of the cross and some of the versions have included a more traditional stations which have traditions like Veronica wiping Jesus' faith or, face or um, Jesus meeting his mother. And then more recent ones have been called the scriptural stations, which use 14 moments that lead up to the cross. And these were created by Pope John Paul II in 1991. Um, It looked more specifically at moments in scripture. And then there's also Jesus' seven last sayings from the cross that have also been used. This week at St. Columba's, we're actually going to be doing a modified version of the stations of the cross for two reasons. And and that's because typically this is a a practice done during a a Lenten service or even on Good Friday of Holy Week, as well as um, usually the stations take a lot longer than our 30-minute service would allow. So instead, we're actually going to do a modified version. And I'm calling this modified version Journey with Jesus. And we'll be using some of these stained glass windows like the one behind me as a way to walk and reflect on the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus using the, these movements of the Apostles' Creed. And William will be playing four musical settings which reflect Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ascension. And while he's playing, those at the Wednesday night service will be invited to get up and walk around to the different stations and reflect on those particular moments. In closing, if you can't join us this Wednesday night, I would encourage you to find your own stations this week whether that's through checking them out at a church or a garden near you, or finding your own way to reflect on your journey with Jesus. Where, especially over the last four weeks, have you witnessed moments of life, of death, of being resurrected again, and of the assurance that Jesus is ultimately reigning in your life? As we close our series, let us remember that we walk in the love of God, who seems in no particular hurry and who enjoys the going there as much as the getting there. Or, as Kazume Koyama, who is a Japanese theologian, said in his book, Three Mile an Hour God, God walks slowly because he is love. If he is not love, he would move much faster, for love has its speed. It's an inner speed. It's a spiritual speed. It's a different kind of speed from the technological speed to which we are accustomed. It's slow, and yet it is lords over all the other speeds since it's the speed of love. It goes on in the depths of our life, whether we notice it or not. 
Let us conclude our series with the prayer that's Paul's exhortation to the Ephesians. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Godspeed. <laughs>